Nature Change viewers, I'm Mike Delp and I'm here with uh, Heather Hettinger who is a fish biologist with the Department of Natural Resources and in my mind she knows an awful lot about rivers and an awful lot about fish so I really appreciate you here today to Thanks for come having and me. talk about the river. So the, the first question I have is what, what does a fish biologist do? I am responsible for conducting surveys mm -hmm. to look at fish populations mm -hmm. in lakes and streams. Um, to gauge whether or not we need to do fish stocking. And if we do, I have to develop um, the protocol for how we're going to do that stocking, what types of fish we're going to put in, how many we're going to put in. Um, I manage a couple of uh, weirs. I oversee the weir here in town. So when you're out serving, you're, you're actually, you're in the river. Yes. You're um, taking samples, you're taking maybe bottom samples, mm -hmm. and you're shocking fish and checking all their vitals yes. and all those things yep. and then returning them to the river. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to kind of direct the conversation toward the Boardman proper. Okay. Um, from your point of view, how, how is the river right now? How, how is it? How does it seem? Is it, is it healthy? Is it? Mm -hmm. I, I would definitely say that it's healthy and I would say that every single day we're getting better. Um, we've seen some really good changes mm -hmm. as a result of the dam removal process. We've done a thousand feet of, of survey work at Brown Bridge every year since 2010. Mm -hmm. And we've got a few years before that too. Um, so that's when we do every single year. The other thing we do is Ranch Rudolph. And what Ranch Rudolph is, is it's a, it's what we call a status and trend fixed site. So we have a program across the state where we do river segments that are um, popular, you know, heavily, heavily used by recre recreationalists. And it's the exact same protocol every single time you go in. Mm. And so it's habitat work. You know, we do set, we do stations across the stream and at every station we're looking at certain habitat parameters or water quality parameters. Um, and it's the same, it's a two pass survey where we come in on the first day and we do the whole thousand feet. We clip all the fish, all the trout that we catch. Mm -hmm. And then we come back the next day and attempt to recapture those mm -hmm. and figure out our, our out migration and immigration mm -hmm. to that stretch to get our population estimate. And then as part of the fish pass project with the reconstruction of Union Street, um, the fish biologists from the tribe and I are doing quarterly sampling in the lower river. Now that you bring up fish mm -hmm. passage, I, yep. I know that uh, that's, that's, it's become a concern mm -hmm. uh, community-wide, and I'm interested in your perspective on it because there is concern about uh, migratory mm -hmm. anadromous fish getting upstream into the upper reaches of the Boardman. What's your position about that, about having big fish come up into brook trout water? Because that's the major concern. It is, and I, I think we're in an interesting situation. So one thing that we see with the Boardman that's a little bit of a stumper is the brook trout. So we have good numbers of brook trout. It's very rare that we find brook trout bigger than eight and a half, nine inches, mm -hmm. or older than age two, and that's, kind of across all these sites that we look at. You know, so it's not site specific. There's not a condition at one site or another that's causing them not to have increased longevity or increased size. The Boardman, you know, we don't have a ton of agriculture in our watershed, mm -hmm. so we don't have huge nutrient loading issues or bonuses, if you want to look at it that way. So, so we have the potential with fish passage to bring some increased nutrients from the Great Lakes um, up into the watershed. And fish that do a lot of that are things like white suckers and smallmouth mm -hmm. bass. And we have pretty robust populations of those in the lower river. Mm -hmm. So I would expect to see at least, at least some additional nutrient movement upstream, which, which will be good for the trout mm -hmm. populations. Um, the fish pass project is really pretty interesting because there's the potential for so much control. So, and I think our response time can be huge. So let's say we did decide to pass something like a coho or you know, a group of coho or some steelhead. Those are fish that we know are gonna leave a system in X amount of time. And, and the way that we monitor the boardman, we do so much work on the boardman that 
it, we really should be able to notice any population changes, negative or positive, mm -hmm. in pretty real time. Mm -hmm. So with a fish pass project, if it, if it works the way that, that everybody is intending it to work, we literally would be able, to, if we see those negative impacts, to stop the action that mm -hmm. is driving those negative impacts. So, you know, we're still in the process of talking to constituent groups and really kind of getting a feel for what people want to see in the Boardman River as far as a fish community mm -hmm. goes. But, but I think no matter what decision we get to, I think there's some real kind of cool experiments that, that we can do on the Boardman that we don't mm -hmm. have the ability to do on others. So we kind of have a window of opportunity here with this fish pass project to really conduct some good science. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one of the things that that, that uh, brings up is um, the, the question of use and mm -hmm. who, who uses the river. Mm -hmm. And so one of the concerns about pass, the passage of fish is the influx of more people. Mm -hmm. So um, how do you feel um, about the idea that the river exists in terms of the most people for the most use. I and completely agree with that statement, but it has to be appropriate use, mm -hmm. right? And it has to be managed appropriately. Of course, it falls under the Natural Rivers mm -hmm. Act. So there are some things that we can do to carefully funnel usage. And, and in the community, we've talked about things like, of course, improving access sites, um, you know, working with liveries to kind of establish some numbers, maybe even going to a permit type system mm -hmm. like we do on other rivers. Um, so there, there's a lot of options out there. And I think we know from creel surveys, we know that the boardman sees moderate use mm -hmm. from anglers. It's not on the high end of the spectrum. It's not on the low end of the mm -hmm. spectrum. It sits comfortably in the middle when it comes to usage. But we don't really know how many paddle sport enthusiasts we have because it just keeps gaining momentum. Mm -hmm. You know, every year I think we're seeing more, and a lot of that has to do with um, the dam removal process mm -hmm. and people being curious. And I love seeing more and more people on a river, but it comes down to educating people how to be good river user mm -hmm. stewards, you know? And it, and it comes down to us as managers, and not just the department, but, uh, you know, the city, they own pretty big mm -hmm. tra tracts of land on the boardman, the county and the township um, and the tribe to really make sure that we're getting the right messages out and make sure that we're creating adequate mm -hmm. access yeah. sites. So is there any appetite in the structure of the DNR to um, permit um, kayaks, to get a permit to use a kayak? Because we, when I get yeah. on the river, I'm buying a trout stamp, right? And I have to pay to use the resource, and which I don't mind doing mm -hmm. at all because I know what that money will be used for. But is there an appetite for that or not, or is that just something you don't want to well, open up right now? Or you know, we've talked about it, but it takes a little bit of a power bigger than us. I mean, that mm -hmm. a lot of those fees and licensing things are all in statute. Yeah. Even our fish licenses. I mean, yeah. the department can't, we can't change right. So that's anything. a legislative it's a issue. Yeah, yep, it's okay. a legislative right. issue. How, how do you see uh, issues about climate change impacting the board? I mean, how have you seen that over time? So we're pretty lucky in the respect that we don't see the magnitude of impacts mm -hmm. like a lot of our downstate rivers mm -hmm. do that are more urbanized. Mm -hmm. You know, I, in talking to some of those biologists, um, they're definitely seeing effects more rapidly than I think we see on the mm -hmm. boardman. You know, we have a lot more like extended season. You know, we tend to, instead of having really rapid warm ups and cool downs, you know, we've been, it's been really weird weather wise, yeah, right? You yeah, know, so we see, strange, yeah, yeah, we see a very mild kind of, kind of summer and a very mild spring mm -hmm. and fall. So, so you see fish spawning a little earlier, or a little later than mm -hmm. you think really would be normal. But, but when you look at temperatures and, and water, it's, they're right. Mm -hmm. It's just our clock is a little bit. Right. Off. Now, are you worried about uh, invasive species like the, the uh, New Zealand mud snail, yeah. the lamprey, mm -hmm. um, which is one of the concerns mm -hmm. uh, about the fish passage being able yep. to stop them? Uh, how about the mud snail? The mud snail is is probably the most worrisome for me right now, simply because we don't know how they function very well mm -hmm. in Michigan. Um, you know, it's really just been the past three or four years that we've had them in Michigan streams. Uh, it started out in the PM, now we have them in the Boardman, the Ensemble, and a couple others. And so we don't know 
how they are going to impact our trout populations one way or the other. One of the big negatives with the New Zealand mud snail is that they're so small that <laughs> if our trout feed on them, they have a tendency just yeah. to pass them through. They mm -hmm. don't digest them well. Mm -hmm. So so fish are the primary vector of movement. You mm -hmm. know, Obviously, they probably got here on an angler's boot mm -hmm. or, or some piece mm -hmm. of equipment. Um, but, but fish have the capability to move them along. Uh, one other thing I wanted to talk about, um, right after the dam broke, mm -hmm. there was a huge, huge slug of sand in the river. Yeah. And uh, the, first, the first summer, it was a disaster mm -hmm. because there weren't a lot of bugs. How do you see that, how do you see, is the sand still in the river? Is it, how does it dissipate in the, in the boardman? It's definitely moving okay. still. Does and it move in a slug? No, no, it, you know, it has a tendency, it, it actually, for the first time, the river's doing what it should be doing, right? Mm -hmm. And and so it's moving sediment, kind of how the river was designed to move sediment. And so it settles at higher rates into deeper spots and in lower rates over gravel. Mm -hmm. And as we have these high water events, which luckily we've had a number of high water mm -hmm. events post the dam breach, you know, that stuff has continued to move down the system. Oh, I God. think probably for me, one of the most frustrating things uh, about uh, the river is um, that people need to be patient. Like uh, where the dam was, uh, ultimately it's going to be an incredible mm -hmm. river up there. Well, and the thing with the boardman too is, you look at Brown Bridge, and, and I think I can say this for pretty much everyone that's been involved in the removal process, that thing really has come back pretty quick. Yeah, You know, it, it really vegetated has. really yeah. fast, yeah. And, and we helped that. You know, the, the tribe and the conservation district have done a ton of habitat work and a ton of planting mm -hmm. up there. But really, even outside of that, you know, aspens moving in and grass popping yeah, it's up. it's going to be amazing. was so yeah. fast, yeah. yeah. So it's been... Well, thank you. Uh, thank you. Really informative. Uh, I'm not surprised because <laughs> I, I, really, I really respect you and the work that you do. So well, thanks, thank Mike. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for tuning in again to Nature Change, and I look forward to talking to you again.